All right, now we're into our 15 minute presentations and we have Dajun Wang, who's gonna uh, talk about understanding career hot streaks. All right, okay, great. Hey, good morning everybody, it's a real pleasure to be here. I wanna tell you a little bit about uh, uh, one journey we've been taking, which is trying to understand what are the unfolding, uh, what are patterns governing an unfolding career. And so this is like started, I would say now looking back uh, a decade ago, where a uh, with a number of colleagues I become fixated on this, what I call the HOPE project, which is motivated by a set of very simple questions. One is, you know, uh, as a career unfolds, when do you do your greatest work in your career? And when you produce a higher impact work following a major breakthrough? In other words, is there HOPE left or are we dead, scientifically speaking? So uh, we've been studying this for uh, a decade now and uh, I feel like we've been chasing the whole picture, we still don't have it. So every time we feel like we understand something and there are new questions that emerge, so I still don't have the whole picture, but we did understand a couple of patterns. And so I wanna share with you in particular one of them, which is the idea of a health streak and try to unpack uh, of this idea. So this is go back to uh, five years ago, uh, my PhD student Lou Liu and I, along with other collaborators, we reported this uh, phenomena that we discovered by analyzing careers of artists uh, over the past 500 years, direct film directors over the past 100 years, and, and scientists uh, from different disciplines over the past uh, 50 years. So uh, analyzing all these different careers, uh, as different as they may seem, we uncover an interesting, uh, intriguing fact, which is they all share a common feature. That's what we call hot streaks. These are bursts of high impact works occur together in close succession, okay? So once we analyze these careers, we realize there are a couple of patterns with the hot streaks, if this is forwarding, okay. Uh, that is, first we realize hot streaks are rather ubiquitous. In, you know, within each domain, about 90% of people have at least a hot streak. Second, it's usually unique. Most people have just one. And then we also realize that how streak actually occurs in terms of within the sequence of the work you produce along your career, it occurs remarkably randomly within the life cycle. Okay, so with equal probability, this may occur on site with your very first work toward the last work or somewhere in the middle. So this adds important nuances to the traditional wisdom that you do your best work in your mid-career. What we're seeing here is that you're really just producing a lot more in your mid-career. It doesn't mean the age and creativity are intertwined, we see a remarkable constant rate of being hit. Uh, states your probability of uh, creating a hit paper or a hit work uh, stays remarkably constant uh, throughout the career. And we also see that uh, it does not last forever. So for most people, this lasts about four to five year period. And then you flip back to where you were before and it appears unassociated with productivity change. In other words, you don't really produce more than we would expect back to otherwise within this period. It's just what you produce during this period seems substantially better than everything else. Yeah? So when the paper was first published, uh, you know, and, and I think this is one of those things of like raising more questions, you know, I've, when the paper was published, I felt like it was deeply unsatisfying because we just reported this uh, phenomena. We had no idea what are the identifiable regularities underneath the beginning of a health streak. And that's why I wrote uh, this kind of raise new questions uh, to me is that, you know, is there any uh, identifiable regularity underneath the beginning of a health streak. And, and so just to be clear, the idea of a health streak obviously is quite important, especially when you think about science, the projection of future impact is very important to a range of decisions that they make, including hiring, promotion, tenure, and research support. So, so if you actually ignore health streak and the singular nature, you know, you may actually systematically over underestimate an individual's true potential, right? So to me, these are essential questions because if we can understand this question, it will allow us to answer a range of new questions. For example, can we anticipate the start of a health streak or the end of it? Can we create an environment to facilitate the onset of health streak and to extend it when it emerges? And for someone who has had a health streak, can we treat it as an indication of that person's potential and help them realize that potential again? So, uh, so I raised this question shortly after the publication of the first paper. I was optimistic I'm gonna find the answer and next year I'm gonna publish the paper. So what happened the two years after that was a repeated attempts of failure. So we tried one hypothesis after another, we just couldn't find one that uh, 
will explain what we're observing. So, uh, so then I was uh, presenting the other day uh, at an NIH symposium with all the program directors sitting there uh, about this finding. And a program, an NIH program director came to me and said, Dashun, can't you see it? This is so simple. Did you say hot streak is four to five year period? So we funded it, you know, that's like, you know, it's so simple, like why that happens? Because our R01s, we funded them. And then I was like, okay, it does not explain artists, but uh, you know, it's actually a, a testable prediction. So why don't I test it? So let's just get all your uh, investigators, uh, see when they got their first R01. Uh, well, see where the house streak is and see where the R01 comes. It does it come be before the house streak or it comes somewhere else? So we analyze that systematically. What we see is that your R01 funding didn't come before the house streak. It comes exactly when the house streak about to end, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> now you realize this actually makes a lot of sense because <laughs> when you publish one nature paper after another, that's where you start getting a lot of money. Uh, so it is uh, <laughs> consistent with the emphasis on preliminary work. Uh, it is a protecting a NIH investment, but at the same time, it does raise a question in my mind that are you funding streak or are you funding retirement? So <laughs> this is like a simple illustration of sort of thinking on the idea of how streak is quite simple, but how do we incorporate this into our daily uh, you know, decision making and calculus in general thinking about careers? It's actually easier said than that, okay? So, so we've been searching for a lot of answers, and then th this is an epiphany moment for me when I was walking around the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam, I'm an art amateur, so I don't know much about art, but I, was, I know Van Gogh was the data point in my sample where his health streak happened in 1888 when he moved from Paris to south of France. So that's where I, re when I was looking around the, these paintings, I realized, oh, you know, even for someone who don't know art, uh, I can actually see some difference maybe before 1888 and afterwards. So that's where I realized if we want to actually study what happens in the health streak, we have to go deep into what the character of the work is, okay? So then my student, uh, you know, Lu Liu and I, along other uh, group members, started to collect completely new data sets. And so these are tracing not just the careers of artists and artwork they produce, but also look at what these artworks are in terms of images of the artwork. So we have 800,000 images. For movies, we look at the plots and the cast information of each movie. And for publications, it's actually easier because we have the publications. And then you quickly realize we run into a problem is 800,000 images is gonna take someone a, a, a bit to actually go through. So that's where we realize, you know, sort of if we, we can actually develop this uh, deep neural network by repurpose a, image, a popular image recognition deep neural network and connect it to a fully connected layer to basically repurpose that to classify paintings. And that's where you see actually you can achieve 97% accuracy. But what we're interested in is to open up the hood of these neural networks and look at different layers that give us different levels of abstraction and say, tell us what are you seeing that gives you this predictive accuracy. So we can do that systematically for all the paintings. And similarly, we can do that for plots in terms of world embedding or thinking about casts of movies in terms of node embedding methods, uh, uh, the, the popular deep neural network methods. And for papers, we can also twist the uh, references of different papers and see <clears throat> What are the topics of each paper as the individual careers unfold, okay? So after we develop all this machinery, now we can test some hypothesis. Uh, out of many factors that have been considered to affect career progression and success, the idea of exploration and exploitation has been commonly considered to think about influence this uh, in a very broad uh, range of literature. So that leads us to ask, you know, are career health streaks reflective of exploration or exploitation strategy? So what we could do is just line everybody up uh, as to where the house streak occurs, look at the work before and afterwards, and measure the entropy of the work, okay? So, and the, so then we find uh, three simple findings. First, what we see is that before the house streak occurs, your entropy is systematically larger than expected. So individuals tend to diversify the topics they work on. So this is uh, before the house streak. This is consistent with exploration strategy. You're trying different topics. And following the onset of house streak, we see that entropy becomes systematically smaller than expected. So you become more focused on what you work on. So this is consistent with exploration, exploitation strategy. 
And third is that we see, despite the differences across three domains we study and the methodologies we use to study them, this idea of exploration, exploitation, and how strict seems consistent across all these domains. Uh, importantly, what we realize is that actually neither exploration nor exploitation alone explains how strict. It's really this exploration followed by exploitation, where the transition from exploration to exploitation closely traces where your house streak occurs. So this is sort of a plausible explanation for this is that exploration is a risky strategy, so it increases uh, your variance and the stamp will found some great ideas. The subsequent exploitation then allow you to focus, build on knowledge and capabilities in that area and foster reputation related to that expertise. So then the idea of exploration before exploitation then serves to expand an individual's creative possibilities. So this discovery of exploration, follow exploitation, then convinced me to try to understand, okay, what about how do we start the first step, okay? How do people explore? So that's the question of, you know, how effectively do researchers actually pivot and change their research directions? And this is a surprisingly understudied question. And we also know that science uh, and society face an evolving array of questions, problems, opportunities. So researchers need to constantly adjust their research stream. And also the concept of adaptability has also been considered a longstanding uh, being more essential to the survival and performance of firms, economies, organizations, and society. But very little is known about how and how successfully researchers may adapt to shifting demand. So in this paper, the follow-on paper with colleagues of my uh, Ryan Hill, Ian Yin, who is here, uh, Caroline Stein, Ben Jones, we want to study the adaptability of scientists and inventors. So we presented two levels of analysis. First is general facts uh, using uh, old, uh, millions of papers and patents and see when people shift what happens. And then second is uh, uh, application use case, which is uh, COVID-19, where uh, in 2020, about four to five percent scientists shifted their career, uh, their trajectory to engage with COVID-19. So over this, what we discovered is a very pessimistic picture uh, in contrast to earlier picture, maybe more optimistic. So this is to me very pessimistic, uh, which is this idea of a pivot penalty. So what we, we develop a measure to quantify how far you are venturing out of your core area of competency. And what we see is that the further you go, the impact of the work just plummets, okay? Systematically declines. And so this is what we call the pivot penalty. As you pivot, it seems to be a great penalty to the impact of the work. And we look at this across our scientists and inventors, a host for scientists and inventors, a host for different fields of science, different patenting domains, and also over time, it gets worse. Okay, so we look at it over the past five decades, we see every decade that penalty grows worse and worse, harder and harder, steeper and steeper. So, but what about COVID-19? We know COVID-19 had a lot of demands for the research, so it's a high impact premium. So when we apply this COVID-19, we see, well, you're right, there is an impact premium, but the penalty is so steep that they sharply de offsets that impact premium. In other words, if you're already working on COVID-19 related research, then you're gonna be great, you're gonna do very well, but if you're actually travel very far to engage with this kind of research, then there's a steep penalty to your work. So what this tells us is on an individual level, there is a deep domain, I emphasize on deep domain expertise, uh, it's individual become more and more specialized. And at science policy level, this is also tell us a limited opportunity to shift our resources and personnel because the scientific workforce appears to be uh, rather not uh, very adaptive. So just a concluding remark, I know you are standing up, so my time is almost up. So I wanna use this as an illustration of with the emergence of new data sets and tools like AI, there are now an enormous opportunity to better understand and improve science. And, uh, you know, and I think science of science and meta science in general is producing new discoveries that can reshape and accelerate the scientific and innovation ecosystem worldwide. I think policy-wise, we also know that there's now enormous opportunity to do more and to do better. And the stakes are extremely high. I think what motivates my work in thinking about how do we improve science is that if we can make R&D even 5% more efficient, the returns to society will be enormous in terms of improving uh, higher standards of living, uh, longer and healthier lives. Thank you. Yeah. We have time for one very short question, very short answer, please.
Thank you so much for your presentation. Daniel Lavelli, Michael Smith Health Research BC in Canada. Question for you with respect to hot streaks. Did you look at the impact on the people that they mentor that are in their labs? I saw the social network with actors and directors, for example, and you can imagine that it would then possibly propagate more hot streaks for the people that they mentor. That's a great question. See, that's a new question that emerged that we haven't looked at. I don't have the answer to that. You know, and I think in general, the mentor mentee data sets, by the way, is just becoming available uh, in a larger scale than previously was available. So I think a, a number of groups right now are trying to work on that data. Maybe one crucial aspect is to try to understand how Hallstreet propagates. Yeah. All right, the other one, is you're gonna have to track Dejan down at lunch and ask your question then. All right, thank you very much. All right, let's, uh, <laughs> thank you.